Hello and welcome to another episode of the Land Party Lawyers Podcast. My name is Steve Blickensdurfer and I'm joined by my colleague and co-host, Nick Brown. If you're one of our regular listeners, welcome back. For our new ones, on this podcast we tackle issues at the intersection of video games, law, and business through debate, discussion, and interviews. We try to focus on the legal issues in particular and offer takeaways and our thoughts, but remember nothing we say on the podcast is legal advice. Today's episode will be focusing on collegiate esports. We'll talk a little bit about Title IX, some of the IP issues in the space, and the concept of going pro. We will then shift gears and interview Tyler Schrote of the Electronic Gaming Federation to discuss various issues facing the interscholastic esports space. We have a lot of content to get through and a, a great interview to get to as well. So let's just dive right in. Nick, why don't you get us started? So back in 1990, Gary Larson predicted the future. Uh, In October 15, 1990, there ran a comic strip by Gary Larson in the Far Side series. It's called Hopeful Parents. And it depicts this little kid. He's a little nerdy kid. He's playing a little game console, probably Nintendo. And his parents are standing behind him. And both of them have these thought bubbles leading to this giant help wanted section in the newspaper that says, Nintendo expert needed, $50,000 salary plus bonus. The next entry is, looking for good Mario Brothers player, 100 grand a year plus your own car. Next one, can you save the princess? We need skilled men and women, 75 grand a year plus retirement. And so Gary Larson had the date of that supposed uh, help wanted section as September 2005. And, you know, the crazy thing is... That's 15 as these years ago. <laughs> it's 15 years ago, right? Right. And uh, these parents in here are, you know, it was a joke at the time that parents might actually expect that their kids would be able to grow up and have a career in video games. Uh, but, you know, a lot of things change over time, and that's, that's kind of where we are today. Bold prediction. I know. And, you know, the, the, the truth is he didn't actually go far enough because uh, even though we haven't seen wanted ads like this, What we have seen is that kids can now go to school and actually get a degree and even get a scholarship for for eSports, for playing video games at a competitive level. And and that's a beautiful thing. Uh, As eSports continue to gain in popularity, so do the school eSports programs. And some schools are even offering full rides and degrees. And so as we're going to discuss today, with them uh, come a variety of practical challenges and legal issues. And Tyler's going to help us understand some of what those are. So, Steve, why don't you give us the lay of the land on uh, scholastic esports programs, especially collegiate? Yeah, I mean, e- esports in, in the college scene and in high school has very, very humble beginnings. I'm going to turn the clock back even further, Nick, before 1990 to 1972. That's the first known uh, collegiate video game tournament. And that was, do you know where they played it, Nick? You do because you peeked at my notes, but it was in Stanford. I was going to say, I do. I'm cheating. The Stanford students uh, got together and hosted a Space War championship. I uh, never played that game. I I assume it's like the uh, precursor to uh, Galaga and some of the other classics uh, that we enjoyed. Uh, But, you know, you can imagine it was a small crowd. It was not broadcast on Twitch, which didn't exist yet. And the first prize uh, was, does anybody know, a subscription to Rolling Stones. Well, a lot of things have changed since then. Uh, Now, fast forward to today, we're seeing schools all over the country implement various types of esports programs with various levels of sophistication. Um, You know, it it really started more or less in terms of dedicated varsity programs uh, with Robert Morris University, which is a private school in Illinois. Back in 2014, uh, they really came out of the gate and went hard on their first esports team. They had matching uniforms, they had team, uh, you know, meals afterwards. It was, they were pretty much modeling traditional sports. Uh, and since then, we've seen varsity programs continue to grow. Uh, a couple numbers here to illustrate the point. In 2016, uh, it is reported that there were about seven schools in the country with varsity esports programs, colleges. Just two short years later, in 2018, uh, there were 65 schools in the country with varsity esports programs. And then to continue the trend, a mere year later, 2019, uh, reports have it at over 130 schools. I'm no math whiz, Nick, but I think that's like an exponential 
uh, graph in terms of the number of schools that are participating in, in esports? Yeah, you, uh, it's it is clear you are no math <laughs> uh, But you know, in addition to these varsity programs that we're seeing, schools are actually offering esports degrees with full rides. Um, a little stat shot, uh, last year in 2019, there's approximately $15 million available in eSports college scholarships, which blows my mind mm -hmm. and surpasses even uh, the wildest dreams of the parents in the Gary Larson comic from uh, 1990. And that 15 million number, by the way, Steve, that excludes tournament winnings. That's just scholarships. That's impressive. Really remarkable. Um, in addition to these, you know, uh, full rides, there's there's formal degree programs in esports. Most famously, the one that has been developed by the Ohio State University. Not not a trademark at this point. I understand the V <laughs> is required. Uh, and you know, the trend that we're seeing in the bottom line here is that we're seeing these increasingly treated like traditional athletics. We're seeing full-time coaching programs where there are people whose full-time job is just esports collegiate coach, uh, which is amazing. We're seeing teams live together in houses. They're treating them like uh, traditional sports with, uh, you know, entire athletic and school and nutritional regimens to accompany them. They're eating meals afterwards together, like you would see a basketball team do. And uh, you know, what, an, another big development is that we're seeing dedicated arenas popping up around the country that are just for esports competitions. Uh, and one in particular is right in our backyard. Give a quick shout out to uh, Full Sail University with their Armada team. They have recently uh, put together the Fortress, which is a very impressive esports arena. Steve and I have visited. It's beautiful. You should consider doing the same. Yeah, esports facilities at universities just make so much sense. I hope to see more of them like that. Um, so where do these teams play? They, they compete in competitive leagues. And so uh, in, in discussing what that scene looks like, you have to start with the, you, you think collegiate esports, you think the NCAA, right? Uh, well, wrong. In, in April 2019, the NCAA Board of Governors actually voted on the issue of whether to govern and hold championships for collegiate esports, and they voted unanimously to table the issue, uh, not for a week, not for a year, indefinitely. So who knows wow. what that's going to look like. That's a pretty... Like negative review, a unanimous vote that we don't ever want to even consider touching this issue. Well, well, I mean, they could always just pick it up tomorrow, uh, but I, it just kind of goes to show you that uh, it's up for grabs as to what the scene will look like. Could you imagine right now if there was no NCAA in football, uh, the opportunities that it creates for other organizations to step in, and that's exactly what we've seen in, in the competitive league space. And so I'm going to name a, a few different organizations in no particular order, uh, but I'll start with Tyler's. The Electronic Gaming Federation is one such uh, organization that has created a, a competitive scene for collegiate esports. You have TESPA, which started at uh, University of Texas, Austin. You have uh, the National Association of Collegiate Esports, or NACE, as they're called. You have Collegiate Star League, which started from uh, Nick, you'd enjoy this, uh, Heroes of the Storm, which is kind of how they kind of- Be still my this. heart. I know. Um, I still shed a, a tear every time that name comes up. We're one of the handful of players that still play that game, I think. Uh, and then you also have game-specific leagues, uh, and, and one that immediately comes to mind is the Riot Scholastic Association of America, which governs uh, Collegiate League of Legends. And so those are just a, a, a few. There are a number of others as well. Uh, but that's just to kind of give you a flair of just the, uh, the cornucopia of leagues that are out there uh, for the competitive side. And although this episode today is focusing on collegiate programs, we'd be remiss if we didn't at least talk for a moment about the high school programs that are developing all over the country. Uh, similar to what we're seeing in colleges, we're seeing a tremendous amount of interest in high schools, and we're seeing the number of people and programs increase over time. Uh, so it's a very similar trend. What we're seeing in high schools is that the uh, organizations are more club-based than like varsity-based, for example, but we're seeing a transition to varsity where they're taking it more seriously, and you know that's a natural fit with the collegiate programs because then they can get you know more uh, training and expertise and context uh, for what they may be interested in doing when they go to college. Um, one quick note on the high school programs, they are developing leagues as well. 
Um, these leagues have various levels of school integration. Some of them can help get you credits. Some are just for fun uh, and bragging rights. Uh, we've seen the high school esports league, which is uh, gaining popularity. Uh, and another big one is Play VS, uh, which we've seen um, increasing as well. So we're, we're going to be watching those going forward. So let's switch gears, Nick, and talk about some of the legal issues, beginning with Title IX of the 1972 Educational Amendments. Now, Title IX is a complicated law, and we're just going to hit the highlights. Uh, so Title IX is a federal law designed to prevent gender discrimination in education programs. It applies to all educational institutions that receive federal funds, uh, public and private, so nearly all of them. And it applies to all educational programs and activities. And so that's when it would capture the athletics and, and, and the courses that are offered. And so what does Title IX require? Title IX requires equal treatment between the sexes with respect to opportunities and scholarships. It does this because the, the goal is to give everybody an equal chance to develop the skills they want and to apply those skills. Historically, the uh, underrepresented sex, which is women, are, are sought to be elevated up to the traditionally overrepresented sex in athletics, which is men. Now, but despite that goal, uh, Title IX does not require mirror image programs between men and women. Uh, I think that's considered a little bit infeasible. Uh, and so compliance with the law can include treatment that is proportional to the participation, right? So that allows students to participate in different sports according to whatever their particular interests and abilities are. So it's designed to help, uh, you know, provide some sort of equity while also being, uh, you know, reasonable in context and, and allowing for some flexibility. Title IX's approach, it does not reduce opportunities for the overrepresented sex, but instead it tries to bring the treatment of the historically disadvantaged sex up to the level of the historically advantaged group, which is, is no small feat. Uh, and when there are issues with Title IX, it's enforced by the Office for Civil Rights of the U.S. Department of Education. So, so how does esports impact Title IX? Although the same Title IX requirements apply to the school's athletics, clubs, and courses, compliance is reviewed separately depending on the level uh, or what we're talking about. So let me give you an example. Title IX treats athletics uh, and, or varsity as intramural sports and clubs as three separate programs. And the compliance findings for one program doesn't necessarily determine the compliance for another. Why is that important? Well, if you have an athletic program and if esports is in the athletic program, then it will be compared with the other athletic programs like football for purposes of Title IX compliance. If esports is a club, uh, in other words, it's student initiated, then it will be compared with the other student initiated clubs. And generally speaking, generally speaking, clubs tend to be more gender neutral, given the way that there's just the, the proliferation of the number of different clubs that are offered and how they are structured or can be structured. Athletics, on the other hand, tends to be less so, which is why some schools don't have a collegiate wrestling team, for example. Now, let's tie back in esports. Esports may actually present an opportunity for schools to achieve Title IX compliance. And why is that? Well, while there's a split between men and women who play uh, video games competitively, uh, that's a little unequal. I think it's about 35 to 65 percent, depending on the source of the information where you get it. The percentage of men and women who actually play video games is closer to equal. It's about 45 to 55, 45 being uh, the percentage of women who play and 55 the percentage of men who play. So really, if you think about it, there really shouldn't be uh, inequality on the competitive level, even though it's being experienced right now. Maybe it will increase going forward and there will actually be greater equality. Uh, and, and that could actually help schools with Title IX compliance rather than hurt, but we're just not quite there yet. Right, and, and particularly tying this back in with the trends we've been seeing, get, choosing to offer a scholarship for esports could raise Title IX concerns because it could impact the balance of treatment of one versus the other. In kind of the same vein, if a school offers an esports club access to funds or equipment that are not enjoyed by other clubs, that could, in, in certain circumstances, also create a problem. 
Uh, now, as we said earlier, this is a complex area of law. Each one of these cases is going to be fact specific, and there are a number of other factors to consider. We're just touching the highlights, so do not go and generate your Title IX compliance program based off this podcast alone. Please, please don't. It will, yeah, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good starting place. Yeah, so let's switch gears real quick and let's talk about player compensation because this is a big area in uh, collegiate sports generally, but it also impacts uh, collegiate esports. So historically, the NCAA has kind of taken a, a position, no compensation beyond the scholarship. And at the same time, they've recently signaled that they'd be receptive to a different approach, right? Which is a huge shift, right? Because that rule has been in place for quite some time. Sure. I mean, they didn't come to this decision uh, by themselves. I think they were encouraged uh, greatly by the California law that recently passed giving student athletes name, image, and likeness rights beginning in 2023. And other states are also following suit, Florida being one of them, uh, that appears to be uh, passing or considering laws that would do the same thing. And so what does that mean? That means that student athletes will now have the ability to earn money from their autographs, endorsements, and commercials. Uh, so this will be an issue to watch going forward as esports develops. But right now, that's you can imagine just esports adding into that. It's just kind of complicating things uh, even further. Yeah, I'm still waiting for my autograph revenue to start rolling in. Uh, hasn't happened yet, but every day I wake up optimistic. Yeah, keep waiting. So that's Title IX. Uh, there are also IP issues that are raised with respect to collegiate esports becoming more popular. Uh, we're just going to mention a couple of them, uh, maybe put them on your radar. You know, esports players, one, one thing that's interesting about esports as an industry is there's the competitive side, and then there's also the practicing and the fan facing side. So, a lot of competitors, esports players of all ages, they'll stream their sessions online, whether it be on Twitch or Mixer or Caffeine or what have you. Now, that almost always, or, or in many circumstances, automatically creates video and audio content. So the question becomes, who owns that content, right? If a, if a VOD is automatically created from your streaming. Uh, if you were streaming under the flag of your esports team under your college, uh, does that impact the rights of, of who owns it or what people might expect? What happens if, for example, a player becomes more popular online than the team they represent? Yeah. Think, think of the TFU phase deal uh, controversy that happened last year. Yeah, some some shades of that uh, dispute. So you know, then that still hasn't been resolved. So you know, we don't really know how how these battles are are going to come out. But it, it does raise a lot of questions. Does does the player who actually did the work to create the stream own it, or does the school team or club own it, or does somebody else own it? What if they play for a team, an independent team, while they also play for the school? That can raise a lot of issues. Uh, as with most things, it's a good idea to set out the expectations through contract ahead of time, even at the collegiate level, so that there are no surprises on the back end right. and any issues can be resolved with some level of predictability. But at the same time, you know, schools also allow their clubs to use the school's logos and emblems. Some do, some don't. Some don't, right. So students, you know, if, if you're out there streaming and practicing and, and trying to get your name out there and your brand and to build your skills, it's important to know what your school's uh, rules are for their IP, whether or not you can, you know, whether they're going to come after you if you stream with your, 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 uh, your school hoodie on, for example. Um, may sound silly, but these are real issues that could, that could raise, and we're going to see more of them over time as the popularity of collegiate esports continues to skyrocket. Right. So I want to shift to one other issue, and then we're going to bring in Tyler for an interview. But uh, the last issue I wanted to talk about, legal issue, is going pro. Uh, it, it's not unique to collegiate athletics uh, or, or esports in particular, but a new question that's facing students who found themselves playing video games competitively, should they go pro instead of college? Right. Uh, what's unique about esports athletics is the average age of today's gamer, uh, which is anywhere in between the age of 18 to 26, depending on the video game we're talking about. So that's that's usually lower than most traditional sports. And so I'm going to give a specific example to a pro StarCraft II player known as Jun Ty Tai Young, right, known as Baby, uh, for playing his first pro match at the ripe age of 13. Right. So, I mean, why? And why? wiping the floor with people. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, exactly. And if you can see his little fingers going. And so why do you do you ask, uh, do esports athletes start so early? It, it, it ranges from dexterity, reflexes, and also just the reality of today's binge gamer. 
uh, people who had have more time to play these games and to practice are tend to be younger. So uh, some schools are being proactive and establishing relationships with with pro teams, and I, I think that's all. That's a great idea, and it's a it, it offers a competitive advantage when you're talking to students who are looking to get into college uh, and and the pro scene thereafter. So much like the the strong relationship that we're seeing between co collegiate traditional sports teams and the pro teams, right? It's a natural progression. Right. Exactly. And and so we you know expect to see more similarities pop up over time. That's right. So at this point, I want to switch gears to the interview. Uh, we are have with us today is very special guest Tyler Schrote, uh, who is the founder of the Electronic Gaming Federation, the governing body for Division One collegiate esports and high school esports across the country. Uh, in addition to overseeing competition, Electronic Gaming Federation also works with its members to build comprehensive programs on campus, focus on competition, education, and social impact. Tyler started out as a Counter-Strike player, I think version 1.6. He spent six years working in higher education and serves as an advisor for Power Spike and mental health nonprofit Rise Above the Disorder. Tyler, it is very, uh, it's great having you on the podcast. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So I, I wanted to ask you the first question, if I may, Nick, and, and just if you couldn't, would give us a brief history on and your involvement in the Electronic Gaming Federation. Um, yeah. So video games for me have always been a really big part of my life. I mean, going all the way back to when I was like three or four years old, uh, where at the time it was Super Nintendo uh, and Mario playing with my older brother and sister, trying to uh, get them to let me play, even though most of the time that wasn't going to happen. Um, but what I realized over time that it didn't really matter what the game was or whether I was playing or not, it was always about that experience and that connection with them. So that's what got me into gaming as, as big as I was basically through my whole life. Uh, and I started playing competitively when my parents uh, finally switched over from dial-up over to broadband. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> at the time, uh, it was uh, Counter-Strike 1.5 when that originally came out as like the Half-Life mod. I uh, was the first thing that caught my attention. So you're more OG than 1.6, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Only in the sense that I played it, not that I was as good at it as some of my friends. Oh, that's okay. Our our listeners know about that. I talk I love StarCraft more than anything in the world and they know I'm terrible at it. So you're you're all set. <laughs> I feel it. Uh but I did start playing competitively when point one point six stabilized and then you started to see um leagues like Cal and Sivo and a whole bunch of other leagues uh that were, you know, enabling me to play for like graphics cards and computers as opposed to like the millions of dollars you can play for now. Um and it was the first uh, opportunity that I had really been able to interact with what I was kind of doing in my free time anyways. So um, I got into teams there, started playing my way through Cal, uh, got to the higher level of play there, and then realized that uh, everybody else on my team was way better than I was. Uh, so <laughs> I was much better served uh, helping them as a manager and kind of, you know, doing the rest of the things outside of the organization. You had other skills to contribute. Yeah, I would say that I was a pretty good coach uh, and in-game leader, but my mechanics were not as good as everybody else's. So I acknowledge that. I went over to it and then switched to the business side uh, and then got more involved in running tournaments and things. So basically I was doing this from the age of like 10 to when I was in high school uh, and throughout that. And then when I got into college, uh, I had made that promise to like not play video games, go be a physics major, you know, give my parents that uh, reassurance that I was going to actually graduate from RIT where I went to school. <laughs> um, but then Twitch came out, uh, StarCraft II came out, uh, and I realized I really didn't want to do physics for the rest of my life. <laughs> so we'll say my life took a pretty drastic turn at that point. <laughs> but your MMR went way up. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I cheesed my way to Diamond in StarCraft II, and uh, that was my crowning achievement for the time. Um, but Diamond Brothers right there. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good time, absolutely. Um, but while I was doing that, I was always uh, also working for Residence Life and Student Conduct. And the consistent challenge that we were always talking about in staff meetings uh, and on the campus in general was about this idea of engagement. Um, because at RIT, uh, we're all infamously nerdy and super proud of that fact. Um, and that did mean for uh, a number of the population that sometimes it was easier to make the choice to just hang out and play video games than to go to class uh, or get involved you know, with other things around campus. So after a while, uh, I had gotten permission to start running tournaments uh, for my floor that I was receiving as an RA. 
Um, and then it kind of evolved pretty quickly from there because as you might imagine, you know, people really like playing video games and they were really into the idea of playing video games against other people in their community. That's great. So uh, it was a great start uh, and eventually it grew uh, outside of our own campus where we got to start inviting teams from other places. Is that how EGF got started? Was it through that endeavor or was it something independent of that? Uh, it really was that. I mean, it, it, for me at the time, I didn't really know it because I was also running like a skateboard business and I was getting involved in other things on campus. So for me, it was something that I could do that was combining, you know, what I was doing as a job, you know, working for Res Life, um, but also something that I really loved doing from the gaming side. So while I didn't know it at the time, it really was sort of the impetus of that where it was literally just me, you know, running tournaments out of my dorm room and out of the common area. So... I mean, that's a fascinating story. You're one of the few people that is able to take something that they have been doing all their life in their free time and, you know, leverage that into um, not only, a, you know, a, a real uh, career, but also one that helps other people. Can you give us a brief history of, of EGF when it started and, and, and where we got to now so our, our listeners can understand the context? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so from basically me starting those tournaments, um, that would have been in like 2012, uh, and then as it kind of grew and we started to think about, you know, can we turn this into something uh, that brought us to about 2013 when I was graduating. Uh, and as every good undergrad student uh, who lives in sort of an ex ambiguous major, uh, for me, it was business and finance. Uh, I had that crisis of like, oh, no, what am I going to do with my life uh, when I graduate? <laughs> So uh, like any good person facing that crisis, I decided to go to grad school uh, and get my MBA. Delay so, it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> delay the inevitable, right? Um, so I stuck around at RIT um, because they had a 4 plus 1 program uh, that I turned into a 4 plus 2 well, as I figured out that EGF actually had some opportunity there. So we continued to just run tournaments um, the same way that we had been, but then we started to look at, okay, well, obviously we need to turn this into a business. So what can we do um, to add in the business part of it? So we started, you know, charging admission. We started to think about building a platform that would look pretty similar to what you'd see from like a Battlefy, um, and then just continuing to develop something that at the time we assumed would just be a platform for college students to play against each other. We didn't really know how to turn that into a governing body yet, but we knew that eventually that would have to happen. Um, and so that was kind of the impetus of it. And then what happened is that over time, we realized that like students had very little money. They had a super high churn rate. So as a result of uh, those sort of shifting sands, it was really difficult to build a scalable business off of that um, without sort of drastically changing pieces of it. So what we ended up doing was moving from working with students and clubs uh, where we kind of got our start into specifically working with administrators uh, and then trying to figure out all the different elements of what did it take to bring a college um, from you know not acknowledging the fact that esports was a thing at all to having a fully functioning program and then being able to answer all the questions and things that you talked about in, in the early part of the episode. Yeah, so what's that challenge like going from working with students to working with the administration? I got to I got to imagine that would be kind of um, whiplash, right? Yeah, it really was. I mean, I think we were kind of lucky in the sense that as we were starting to do that, um, people were starting to think about esports as like this really attractive idea. They weren't really sure what it meant, but they were willing to take more risk than they might have been otherwise if you were trying to disrupt like a, a really well established industry. And the way that we came to it was obviously lots of trial and error, lots of research and working with schools, uh, oftentimes just helping them set up like small versions of programs at, at smaller colleges. Um, and then I think what really helped us out is the fact that there's, you know, well over a century of sports history that you can go back and look at and say, how did this develop? Why did it develop this way? What are the choices that they made that kind of had this outcome or the other? And how can we take all of that knowledge to develop the system that we wanted to um, it kind of takes advantage of that blank slate of esports in college and in high school to turn it into something that we felt would be the best version of traditional sports in the context of esports. So that meant that as a company, we had to be the governing body. We had to deal with all the things um, that you mentioned before, player compensation, Title IX, where these programs are all listed, what the standards were. Um, and then because no colleges were ready at the time to meet anywhere close to those standards, we started the second part of our, our business, which was working with all of our campuses to build those programs out. So not only are we right. saying, here's what esports is, but here are the things that you need to be able to 
include in your program and here's how you're going to take this from just playing with playing video games to something that's going to have a much broader and, and more important impact on the students that we're working with like a starter pack but more more sophisticated and so all this all this happened before april 2019 when the ncaa decided hands off they're not going to get involved yeah we uh, had been kind of going down this path of saying we didn't believe that the NCA had a role uh, in esports, uh, and there were obviously lots of people that were trying esports in different ways. But you couldn't address the growth of esports at the collegiate level by just being another tournament organizer. You had to be able to answer what can be really difficult questions uh, for a campus that really required a lot of specialized knowledge. So we sort of positioned ourselves to make sure that we were able to understand, to research, and ultimately create these you know, positive things. So how do you describe EGF as compared to some of the other um, organizations out there? Um, for us, the focus is sort of a combination of challenges, uh, well, identity, both in terms of the market that we choose to inhabit, as well as sort of everything that we do around it. So. Uh, compared to um, the rest of the people in our space, uh, we're specifically a varsity level league, um, which means that all of our schools uh, have officially endorsed teams. Uh, it comes with varying degrees of, uh, or very various definitions of what that means uh, from campus to campus as we kind of yeah. work towards everybody meeting those same that, standards. That must be hard dealing with all the different programs that, you know, it. it probably an apples to apples comparison is too much to ask for, right? Right now, yeah. I mean, it's getting a little bit easier because you have uh, people that like very clearly exist in the club space and they're focused on either intramurals or intercollegiate uh, club activities or things like that. So while they exist in our space, like we don't wouldn't consider them someone that would overlap with us a whole lot. Um, and then as you think about um, even the space of varsity, which would be primarily like us and NACE, NACE's membership is primarily like NAIA, D3, and D2 schools, uh, where we're very specifically just focused on D1, mostly in the Power 5 group. Um, and we did that on purpose just because we felt that it was the best chance to sort of take the model that we wanted to implement, work with a group of schools that had a very similar mindset, and then be able to translate that to other opportunities in the future. If you're going to go, go all out. Yeah, that's fascinating that you're focused on the varsity level league. And, and we now know that has a legal meaning. Uh, when you're talking about a varsity level uh, versus club or, or otherwise. Um, do you have schools that come to you and they haven't set it up and they're kind of looking for guidance? Yeah, I, most of the schools at that level are in that space. I mean, like we, um, so we helped build Ohio State's program uh, before it launched uh, and other programs uh, or other schools rather. Are you referring to the Ohio State University? The Ohio program? State, oh, okay. yes. Just making sure, I, I was confused for a second. Of course. <laughs> Uh, my apologies, uh, but they um, most most schools are in a position where they know about esports, they're aware of it, they know that it's not just you know a fad and it's something that they should be investing in. But the challenge that most of them face is that they don't know where to put that enthusiasm, and oftentimes those are mired in questions of, as you uh, alluded to previously, like where do you put it on campus. How do you fund it? What does the model exist around that? Who are we going to play against? How are we going to play against that? Um, what are the issues that we're going to deal with as it relates to um, everything from the fact that, as you mentioned, like students are streaming on Twitch, that's going to be something that goes against amateurism. Like, you know, all these different questions that if you're, you know, an administrator at a college that's sitting there just trying to figure this out, um, it can be really overwhelming and ultimately prevent you from taking the step to get into it. So our out-of-the-box package, if you will, for program development really came from the idea that if you could uh, just make it as easy as possible, narrow it down to like the 10 or 15 decisions that you have to make, and then show the path to developing all the other elements that you need, um, it would remove enough anxiety from the schools that they were able to actually take that step. And I bet they appreciate that. What a great service. Um, so my, w one question that this makes me think of is, does EGF have a stance on whether every school sh you know should be varsity or club are you, are are you is your mission statement to help every school become varsity or are some schools more appropriate to stay in, in kind of a club type formation? Uh, certainly our philosophy is that we want to get to everybody being varsity um, but we also understand that for different schools that's going to mean very different things. So we look at sort of the definition of a varsity program from a competitive perspective first and that's relatively easy to get to because it just involves the way the team is managed and the resources that the university is putting into that. But everything else that exists around that becomes a little bit more complicated um, because, uh, for example, in our league, um, we decided that we would not have any amateurism clause. 
So when we work with our schools, it's thinking about, um, we know that your students are already streaming on Twitch. So we developed a policy that allows that to happen. Oh, wow. So you, you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that means that you already just assume that everyone's already doing it. That's how popular it is. And so you're working around it. Yeah. I mean, we, our general philosophy behind it was like, if you're in a position where you're an influencer or you want to be, um, and you have the ability to generate value for yourself that you should, the challenge was how do we marry that culture uh, with that of very conservative universities who are used to doing everything in a very different way. So it required us to think about, you know, how are we working with universities to make them comfortable with that opportunity? How are we marrying it with the fact that their athletes across campus would not be able to do so? Um, and then what sort of protections do we have to put in place for players um, to make sure that they weren't um, in a position where they were you know, being approached and taken advantage of by like predatory agents or at a very base level, even just understanding like, what does it mean to be a Twitch streamer and run that business and how do you pay taxes? So we really try to think about it from its fundamentals I and mean, having myself not being too far removed from that experience, um, being able to address those and then ultimately be able to educate our campuses to say, this is what you're going to see. This is a plan to deal with this. And if you're not ready to do this, here's the steps that we're going to take with you in order to get to that next level. Well, that's fantastic because that's kind of why we started this podcast for purposes of educating the masses on these issues that don't often get talked about uh, because they're kind of in the shadows or at least they're coming out of them. Uh, so that's great. And I can now see uh, more clearly the, the educational aspect to what you do. Uh, and so I applaud you for that. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about was your the game agnostic approach uh, that you guys have, or just your approach, just general h- how you choose which games are are being played in your in your competitions and in the different leagues that you set up. Of course. Uh, so for us, college and high school uh, league offerings are entirely uh, membership driven. So we run national surveys every year. Um, they give us a really strong snapshot of what students across all of our campuses, uh, both high school and colleges, uh, what they're playing, what they're watching, what they have an interest in. And then based off of that, um, we'll make recommendations to our schools as to which games they should be investing in. Um, or inversely, if you have a game that has historically been strong, but then basically dwindles down to nothing, um, how to ease out of that. Cough, heroes of the storm, cough. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, because it, the way that we think about it is always around the, the students are always the center of the philosophy. So obviously, like if we decide to drop a game or add a game that has pretty strong implications to scholarships, to people that, you know, made a college decision based on, you know, that type of opportunity. So we look at um, if we're able to move with the times as we should be, you know, games rise and fall in popularity as they're always going to. Um, how do we kind of smooth those edges out for our universities to make sure that you don't have a student that in their second or third year suddenly doesn't have a scholarship anymore? Um, and then some of the other challenges of just making sure that, you know, we're kind of working across what a campus expects from everything of like content standards and then obviously like dealing with the licensing and things on the on the publisher side. Well, that actually gets me to my next question, dealing with the game companies and the licenses that you have to obtain to play certain games. Um, when we were seeing Riot create the Riot Scholastic uh, League, um, do you see like a trend to where, uh, well, first question is, does that cut you out from playing that game? And second question, do you see a trend of, of game companies some of them going to create more leagues for their games or do you see that kind of being one off for the really really popular games out there um i think their uh, developers involvement in the collegiate or even high school scene is pretty variable um, because you'll see people like riot who obviously take a much more hands-on approach to certain elements of what it means to be a part of their esports ecosystem and then on the other side of the spectrum you have a, a developer like valve that basically says you know as long as you're not doing something that goes outside of our terms of service or uh, creates some like really horrible problem, we're pretty hands off. So I think for us, we kind of look at it as always creating an opportunity to um, generate benefits for our colleges, for our students, and for the developers in a way that makes sense from a business perspective. So in some cases, that means that we, in all cases, that means that we're going to work in different ways with different publishers. Some of them, we won't be able to run a game for a period of time uh, until I think we're significantly more established in the economics and the development and structure side of it makes more sense. Um, But others are kind of in this position where they just said, you know, we know we need this. We don't really know what it looks like. So we're just going to give it to everybody. Uh, and then whoever wins out in the end, based on you know quality of structure, experience, and so on, will will be the person who 
kind of by default takes that position. Yeah, that makes sense. So, well, what about for the games that the developer is not coming in and and calling the shots or or you know being very very hands on? How do you choose like the rules or the structure for a league or or for a particular game? How do you how do you deal with that? Do you try to like you know take notes from other leagues or do you get instructions from the companies themselves and modify those or, or how how does how do you go about solving that problem? So we started with a uh, foundational league rule set, which we basically took from a, a combination of professional sports leagues uh, and the NCAA. So we looked at MLS, NFL, uh, the NCAA, uh, U Sports in Canada, and a couple other groups to say, if we're dealing about the collegiate environment first, which is where we obviously live and have to deal with, here are the things that are most important to address immediately and that are going to be universal regardless of what game you're playing. Um, so that's things about like eligibility and transfer rules and uh, how institutions, you know, enter and leave the league and, and that kind of thing. And then for each game, when a new game comes into it, uh, we first look at uh, our own experience running tournaments uh, on the esports side and say what worked and what didn't. And then we'll also look at um, what the professional counterparts uh, for that game are doing. Um, like, for example, uh, if we were talking about NBA 2K, uh, we look at the NBA 2K League and say they're running uh, 5v5, which makes sense in a team perspective. Uh, are we going to choose to use that as opposed to a 1v1 scenario? Um, and it's pretty similar for every game where we'll take inspiration from a bunch of different places. Mm -hmm. And then we present it to our members. Uh, and just like in the NCA, they're the ones that ultimately made that choice. Um, given that not all of them are, are gaming experts in this or game experts in each particular element of it, we'll usually work with the publisher to say, this is what we're thinking, this is what we have to do to match the logistics requirements of you know, the collegiate environment, and then try to make sure that there's a, a system that works for everybody that ultimately makes life easy and pleasant for the players, or at least as best we can. Well, that means that you're never... Um not doing something you're always doing something always probably changing right. and tinkering rules because games are constantly you know what fortnite is dead right and that wasn't that uh trending well you know a couple of weeks ago uh and then you know another game comes out just as super popular that's just kind of the the reality of of esports and in particular collegiate esports especially when you're taking the temperature of your populace and saying we're going to play what you're most interested in right now mm -hmm. right and so you're constantly having to that's fascinating and so hats off to you guys for doing that um i had kind of a, a, a side question what do you say it related to some of the other issues that we talked about earlier what do you say to the student that asks the school and maybe the school comes to you with this question uh if they should go pro instead of uh, going to college for for esports it's definitely one of the more interesting parts of esports, given all the stuff that you mentioned before. Um, and we actually, uh, when we were thinking about eligibility and recruitment and all that kind of stuff, was one of the fundamental factors as to how we designed our system. So we thought um, that the idea that we were going to end up mirroring a similar progression of like, you know, youth to high school to college to pro, as you see in traditional sports, probably wasn't going to happen with esports. It may become that way over time, but certainly right now, um, as you mentioned, uh, you're more likely to have someone who's high school aged going into Overwatch League or the LCS or, or whatever other league. So our expectation was you'd be more likely to get recruited out of our high school league um, than you would out of our college league, at least in most cases. So we started with um, the high school side of it being really well developed to allow students to understand what that choice to go pro meant. And then when we bring that to the collegiate scene, the three scenarios that we were looking at were the normal transition of high school to college, the opportunity to, from, to go from college to pro, but also from pro to college. And so as we were thinking about those standards and what we offer to students is really thinking about the different factors in your life. Um, in theory, you can always come back and get an education. That opportunity may not always be there from the professional gaming side of it. Right. So, I think my ship has sailed, by the way. I don't think I'm ever going to make it. <laughs> Maybe, but you never know. Um, but what we were thinking is, like, we, we didn't want to tell people, I mean, just like you have said a couple times during the podcast, you're not giving legal advice. We're not telling people to, you need to go pro or anything like that. It's more about saying... Smart. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to offer you the tools to make that decision for yourself because we're going to be able to lay out, here's what you have right now in terms of a scholarship, opportunities, and things like that. Here's what the professional team that you're thinking about joining is offering um, from a, a, a realistic perspective. And then making sure that we're telling uh, the individual that, like, 
here's a good opportunity for you to have a lawyer to help you understand like what are these commitments and how does that work um, and then help to try to map that out the best we can obviously like we can't do that for every single player and everyone's going to make different choices um, but we wanted to really set that philosophy of if we were in a position to inform and educate and ultimately influence um, the ability to make the decision, then that would help them out. And then our job as a league were to say, if you're a pro player that wants to come back into the collegiate scene, how do we make that work in a way that's going to be beneficial to everyone? Um, and the same in all those other scenarios. And it's also important to point out, I mean, it's not just going pro is the only thing in esports, right? There's a whole ecosystem of esports that you can get involved in, and it might help to have a college degree to help you with those things. I know some schools really focus on that, um, and, and I think it's just also helpful to point out. It's like we're talking about the 5% that make it to pro, and there's like a 95% that also participate in, I don't know, doing the lights and doing the sound and uh, commenting and all that stuff. So yep. anyway, that's wonderful. And I'm surprised you're not a lawyer for, for all the disclosures you have to make. <laughs> I feel like it's sometimes uh, <laughs> with the amount of time I work on uh, legal documents and stuff. But <laughs> I, I mean, I think you're right on, on the parallel paths, right? Because as you mentioned in my intro, like a big part of us has been recognizing that while we talk a lot about the varsity level and about the players that are going to be that representative team of the university. There's huge communities around it on every campus. I mean, like some of our campuses are over 50,000 or 60,000 undergrads. So like, of course, there are people that love video games, but they're not going to be on that team. So when we're working with our campuses and talking about those opportunities, it's thinking about, you know, if you're going to run a team, why not create some of these opportunities or some of those positions and turn those into educational opportunities where a student can be a coach, a social media manager, uh, or any number of other positions that are ultimately going to prep them for jobs they might find elsewhere. Um, like, for example, we run a broadcaster academy program where starting in high school, students can actually get on with us, learn how to do broadcasts, and then we'll pay them to actually you know, do commentary for our matches. Oh, that's great. Win-win hands-on training. Right. Um, because I'm, I'm continuously thinking about like what my experience going through uh, high school and ultimately college was and, and what led to that existential dread after I graduated and trying to think like, you know, how can I prepare people for the experience that I have now much earlier? Um, and it also speaks to the way that we address things like um, the number of women uh, in gaming we know that we there's no overnight solution for that kind of thing. So we look down all the way to the high school and youth levels and say, what can we do to make this environment more positive um, and ultimately more inclusive so more women are staying in it longer as opposed to dropping out somewhere along the way and making sure that all the missions and the, the uh, I use the, the description of saying like, we talk about these as, as systemic issues, whether it's education, mental health, inclusivity and diversity or any of these other things. Mm -hmm. um, and because we've taken the position that we are the system, that means that those challenges are our challenges. So you have to address all of them in, in different ways. And yeah, absolutely. It's, it's not going to be fixed tomorrow, but it's something that we've made really clear that's important to all of our schools, all of our students and to us. Uh, and so we're taking those steps to, to make sure that it works. That's great. That's fantastic. Well, in, 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 on the same topic, in, in your capacity as advisor and tutor and uh, mentor, uh, can you just real quick tell our listeners how they can get a sweet giant Viking beard like yours? <laughs> uh, get lots of sleep, believe in yourself, uh, and remember that it's the beard on the inside that really counts. There you go. Wise words. I love it. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode. Be sure to check out our other episodes from season two and season one because we those issues are still important. Uh, you can connect with us on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and on our page, landpartylawyers.com. Huge thanks to Tyler Schrote for coming out and helping us and our listeners understand what it's like to work on the ground and developing one of the premier esports leagues in the country. Uh, thank you so much for giving us your time and the benefit of your experience. Uh, hopefully, um, people will be able to take this to heart and uh, we'll see even more of the great trends that we've been seeing so far. Agreed. Thanks so much for having me. All right, Nick, unless you have anything else to add. That's all I got, but thanks for listening. And until next time, game on. Game on. You've been listening to the Land Party Lawyers podcast series with Steve Blickensturfer and Nick Brown. To learn more about our e-gaming and esports practice, visit carltonfields.com.
This podcast is intended for general information and educational purposes only and should not be relied on as if it were advice about a particular fact situation. The distribution of this podcast is not intended to create and receipt of it does not constitute an attorney-client relationship with Carlton Fields. Thanks for listening.